Our next guest, uh, latest yeah. article, examines uh, whether bank short selling should be banned. I want to bring in Liz Hoffman, Semaphore Business and Finance Editor, and the piece uh, that she writes, quote, short sellers have made $7.4 billion by betting against the regional banks since the beginning of March. And we want to thank you for joining us. Do you think there's a chance it gets banned? I mean, we lived through this in 2008, and there was a moment, and there's been, you know, go back to 1930, I think uh, President Hoover talked about potentially banning short selling. I mean, that. This has happened before, this conversation. It has. Uh, good morning. Thanks for having me. I mean, listen, it, the, 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 the historical inputs seem to suggest that it doesn't really work. So I don't know that it's the, exactly the right move here. But I will say that, you know, this is not a depositor story anymore. It's an equity story. You know, depositors, the latest data suggests they stopped freaking out about two or three weeks ago whereas the equity markets have gotten increasingly bearish on these banks. And so if you have an equity problem, I think it requires an equity solution. And I can't think of another one. Now, to your point, to the extent it has worked, it works when it's a bridge to a very clear thing. So in 08, yeah, bank stocks continued to go down during that two weeks, but actually outperformed the market. And in the meantime, they passed TARP. So if you have a very clear endpoint that you are trying to bridge increasingly nervous equity holders to, it's not a it's not a terrible idea, I don't think. How long would you put it in place? It was two weeks last time. I mean, the funny thing, it's not funny. The thing about this particular crisis is that it has been like fits and starts, very slow moving. And then a lot of urgency and something goes terribly wrong. And then we settle back into this kind of low level um, drumbeat of kind of anxiety, but not enough urgency to actually do anything about. You know, I, you know, I asked Jay Clayton about this, who I, and I was on your show talking about this last week, and he said, look, it's a temporary bridge. So if you can, if there's an idea that you're building towards perhaps uh, recapitalizing these banks, either privately or publicly, or making explicit that deposit right. guarantee, because right now you have this deposit asymmetry where the, at the biggest banks, they're effectively insured. The smaller ones, no one's really clear in the Fed. And Treasury have kind of gone out of their way to, right. you know, to, to not say those well, words Liz, out loud. I've, so I've made the argument that even if you guaranteed the deposits at this point, if you're the treasurer of, of a small business or a big business and you have money at a regional bank and you see the stock falling precipitously, whether you think your money is guaranteed or not, you're taking the money. You just are. Which, and so then the which question, is if, why that's, this is... if that's true, then the, but then there's a secondary question. You talked about two weeks. You know, you'd almost have to put this in place for two years. I mean, we've been going through, the, as you said, fits and starts. It's not clear that there's a beginning and an end here. And then you get into I, I, you get into Q1, Q2 of 24, when I think you're going to start to see the roll on some of the commercial real estate issues uh, affect some of the banks, uh, some of the smaller banks especially. And then it gets even more complicated. I totally agree. There's, I mean, I've never really understood this argument of this shadowy cabal of short sellers. Um, that said... You know, in regional banks, it kind of works, right? If you say, I think McDonald's is going out of business tomorrow, I don't think people stop buying their hamburgers, right? There's a real vulnerability baked into bank stocks that doesn't exist for other stocks. Um, so I think it puts it on the table in a way that it probably wouldn't elsewhere. But to your point, the other, the other thing here is that there is a rational argument that these banks should, should be massively re-rated as stocks anyway, right? That their margins are going to be massively compressed for the next couple of years. They're replacing very cheap deposit funding, either having to pay out for deposits or relying on, you know, that Fed term loan facility, which is quite expensive money. So, you know, should we stop uh, investors from expressing a pretty legit thesis that these stocks are going to be worth less in the future? I don't know. Right. Liz, what do you think about just the idea that maybe we should uh, follow Canada and Australia and some other countries and just call it a day and just decide we're going to have, you know, four, five, six big banks. I mean, I, it's almost sacrilegious to say that in the United States, given that we, we like community banks. They've been uh, great lenders, especially to small businesses throughout the country. And it's unclear what happens if you just have, you know, four, five, six big banks. But, but maybe that's almost what's happening already. I agree. I've been kind of a reluctant defender of too big to fail. You know, and, you know, you lived through this in 08. When you have a problem, you want the risk in a room where you can see it, right? You want to be able to send eight black town cars to these banks and say, we want your CEO at the Fed in an hour. That is very hard to do in America. We have thousands of banks. I think to your point, we are sort of nostalgic for this kind of frontier bank that, I don't know, this sort of daily savings and loan that doesn't practically exist with the exception of small business, some real estate, and you'd have to find a way to incentivize the big banks to really want to take over that business. Um, but there's a very fair argument to be made that we have way too many banks in this country.